uh, we have here Silvia Maeso with no, uh, with us. Um, probably you already know uh, her work because she's teaching and she's probably your teacher. <laughs> so I'm not going to present her much. She's working with us as principal researcher at SESH for a long time. I can't remember exactly. <laughs> and she's a lecturer in human rights and sociology of the state. She's teaching um, in these two PhD programs. Um, she was also a, a principal investigator for the European Research Council project called The Politics of Anti-Racism in Europe and Latin America. Uh, she co-edited two books on Eurocentrism, uh, and she will um, discuss uh, further the topic through her, her own uh, experience and knowledge. Good morning, everybody. Bon dia. Well, thank you very much to Marisa and uh, Irina for uh, organization and the invitation. I said when I received the invitation, I was a little bit nervous. I said, well, I don't really work on, on, on the situation of, of refugees and international border. My, my research is on racism and anti-racism, but I want to share with you uh, some notes. Uh, I'm going to write, to read, sorry, so to keep it short. Uh, but I want to comment on the, the title of this note that I'm going to read to you is Revolt for Freedom in the Prisons and the Streets. And it comes from this picture that I took. And I, and I want to be honest, I don't know the story behind the picture. I was on a bus in uh, um, in Auckland and I was on, uh, on my way to, to Berkeley, to the university. And I saw this uh, panel, big, big panel. And I just took the picture from the bus. And I tried to find out and I didn't find out what is the story behind the picture. Of course, we were, I mean, in Auckland, which is the place of, uh, of uh, I mean, the really deep history of, uh, of Black radical insurrection, well, the Black Panthers, etc. And I don't know if it has to do with, with this, but for me, it was uh, telling, you know, the idea to uh, revolt for freedom and the idea to link, to link the, the, the revolt on the streets with the revolt in prisons, and that we are used to, is part also of the, of the system of oppression to, to the link, you know, the, the prison space and, and, and the streets and mm -hmm. to unify in this for me. Uh, I mean, I use a lot this this picture, I must, I must say, but I don't know the story behind the, the this panel. So my end today is to share some notes on the conceptualization of revolt as a technology of freedom from the perspective of what Cedric Robinson famously coined as the black radical tradition. It's a commentary that is part of a wider discussion and work I'm developing with my colleagues, Daniel Araujo and Luana Coelho on this idea of uh, conceptualizing technologies of, of freedom. And my comment focuses more on, on urban struggles or what is happening in, in cities and with specific prison, uh, prisons in, in, in urban spaces. So I will start with the rebellion that took place in different cities in the UK in 2011. On August 4, a Metropolitan Police officer shot and killed Mark Duggan, a 29-year-old Black British man in Tottenham, an impoverished area in inner North London. This killing and the subsequent denial of information and disrespectful treatment of Duggan's family by the police motivated the organization of a protest at the Tottenham Police Station. These events sparked an insurrection in several cities for a week against police violence and harassment of Black youth the so-called English summer riots in of 2011. And David Cameron's government mobilized 16,000 police officers in London. Darkus Hall, yeah. Darkus Hall that passed uh, um, uh, in 2017, journalist, broadcaster, and key political figure of the black movement since the 1960s was interviewed on live television by the BBC on August 9. The news anchor, Dwight journalist Fiona Armstrong, asked how if he was shocked by the events and he replied, quote, no, not at all. Our political leaders had no idea, the police had no idea, but if you look at young blacks and young whites with a discerning eye and a careful listening, they have been telling us and we will not listen. End of quote. Armstrong interrupted how and raised her main concern. Does it mean that you condone what happened in our community last night? Hal replied that the central issue here was the brutal killing of Mark Duggan and the treatment that his family received. The BBC journalist challenged Hal's statement because there was no official inquiry on Duggan's death yet. And she insisted, insisted on questioning him about his long involvement in riots. So the idea, you know, you're, you're involved in, in violence, you know, and reproducing violence. Darkus Ho, expressing his anger, replied that he had never taken part in a single riot 
I have been, it has to do with the meaning of how this white journalist wanted to frame what is a riot, you know. Uh, so he replied, I've never taken part in a single riot. I have been on demonstrations that ended up in conflict and have some respect for an old West Indian Negro instead of accusing me of being a riot. End of quote. How was response to the BBC journalist this respect is rooted in his decades long participation in collective organization and a struggle against racism and police brutality in the UK and particularly in London. Revolt as a technology of freedom problematizes predominantly white understandings of violence and political ethics, which are embedded in the technologies of control and suppression of black radical politics. Instead of engaging in this sort of conversation about how and where we draw the line of you know, what is respectable and civilized politics, we should rather develop, you know, borrowing from Howe's advice, an exercise of careful listening that unravels processes of resistance to and confrontation with the racial state and the private and public interest it protects. I propose to conceptualize revolt from three interrelated analytical lenses. The first lens is the diaspora, and also problematic, I know this is a problematic concept, but Sometimes it's a forced diaspora. But the focus on diasporic politics as a lens that allows going beyond flat comparisons between countries and to embrace the legacies of long historical processes of revolt against racial enslavement and technologies of control and punishment. It, of course, many people have, uh, I'm not <laughs> saying something new, many people have worked uh, on this. Um, it is also crucial, as, uh, it is also a crucial lens to avoid the constant invocation of racial exceptionalism that locates real races in a specific national uh, geographies and has constructed many times, you know, European and Latin American regions as different, specific or new to races, you know, like new to immigration, new to this reality of the refugees, you know, this is very uh, typical, for instance, in countries like Spain or, or Portugal. For the last three decades, revolts and mutinies against racist police violence and regimes of incarceration in European cities have called for an understanding that breaks this rhetoric of European exceptionalism regarding racial segregation, racist police brutality, and incarceration regimes. And the second lens I want to uh, speak about here very briefly is the logics of genocide. Black radical thinkers such as in Brazil, for instance, Ana Flausina, Joan Vargas, also in the United States, Joy James, Jaime Amparo Alves, Luciano Rocha, Jurema Bernek, or Dylan Rodriguez, they have recentered, again, it's not new, but they have recentered the notion of genocide in order to understand contemporary Black rebellion as processes against the naturalization and negation of institutionalized routine logics of modern racial violence and anti Blackness. It is crucial to note that in Brazil, as Jurema Bernek reminds us, the understanding of the disproportionate high rates of violent deaths of Black youth as at the genocide of Black youth has been made by Black organizations and communities in a struggle. So it's a conceptualization that comes from the struggle, not from the academia, or travels then to, to the academia. They expose the logics of a state sanction violence perpetrated by police organizations and ineffective poli public policies. So all this public policy about public security that is very much connected also to uh, um, to national security regimes, you know, that, that we, we spoke yesterday. Um, so they expose these logics of state sanction violence perpetrated by police organizations and ineffective public policies. And it's part of what Anna Flausina uh, defines as a black thought that is not under white tutelage. In the European context, revolt against resistance. Uh, Revolt against uh, the, and resistance to institutional racism exercised by border regimes, immigration legislation, police violence, and incarceration. You know, black organizations, for instance, such as Sindicato de Mantero or Street Vendors Union in Madrid, make evident the, contra the connections between these technologies of death against the, uh, against the naturalization and spectacularizing of suffering black bodies. In Spain, the Centros de Internamiento de Extranjeros, or foreign and intern centers, the so infamously, you know, uh, very well-known CS, have been for years the scenario of mutinies and revolts that demand freedom. As for instance, you know, in the center of in, uh, internment center in, of Aluche, this is the picture, Aluche in Madrid. Aluche is a neighborhood, working class neighborhood uh, of the periphery of Madrid. Um, so different mutinies and revolts in 2016 and 2020. The justice in you know, prison or uh, detention and internment systems are part of the ongoing genocide of poor black and Arab Africans because as Tendaye Ashume, I don't know how to pronounce, sorry, um, 
uh, her name, contains, uh, quote, contemporary national borders of the incas in, incas international order is an order that remains a structure but imperial inequity are inherently racial. And as also as Bushani examines through the Manus prison theory, border regimes are fueled by racial imaginaries and colonial logics. Racial borders also operate inside the nation state and the cities. The criminalization of poor, uh, this is from the, the, the meeting in 2020 in Madrid. Um, so racial uh, borders also operate inside the nation state and the cities. The criminalization of poor black and brown bodies in marginalized urban neighborhoods promote the favela prison pipeline as it has been theorized in Brazil. A pipeline that passing through the juvenile detention centers. For instance, in countries such as the Peruvian, uh, where the silencing of institutionalized races is paramount, mutinies in and escapes from juvenile so-called rehabilitation centers are constant. However, escapees are not respectable rebels because they are seen you know, as young criminals and their families are pathologized and punished as unfit you know, to claim rights. So this is uh, juvenile centers. This is uh, um, in the north of Peru, in, in Piura, you know, where families are constantly, mothers are constantly you know, uh, denunciating the torture that this young, uh, um, and well, legally minors, you know, are suffering within these so-called rehabilitation, rehabilitation uh, centers. Um, yeah, this is from Maranguita, which is uh, the big, big uh, so-called rehabilitation uh, uh, center in, in Lima. And it's also located in the center of, of Lima City and it's constantly lots of, of mutinies uh, inside. And finally, the third lens uh, to, to analyze uh, resistance is joy as resistance. We, this has nothing to do with kind of romanticization of, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, oppression. But revolt against modern racial violence is a political praxis in the more profound sense of the word political, the power to think and live a good life. Revolt is rooted in the everyday experiences of black brown peoples in geographies, I quote here Al Jaime Alves and Joy James, quote, in geographies of terror and resistance that radically challenge the limits of rights and so-called human rights and citizenship regimes. Insurgence is an embodied and territorialized process. And also revolt as act of resistance and defiance are mostly seen through the rates of confrontation Joy goes usually unnoticed and not unnoticed. Commenting on, commenting on Toy Derricott's poem, Joy as an Art of Resistance, Black writer and producer Austin Channing Brown states that Derricott gave Black women, quote, permission to also see our joy as giving a middle finger to white supremacy, end of quote. So like dance hall, perreo, samba, long nails, exuberant makeup, hairstyles, laughter, commonly appropriated by white and white and women and men are all forms of saying to the world, the joy of blackness persists. And I end up here and I just wanted to show Monica Cunha, uh, who we, we also interviewed for a, a short documentary that we produced in the, uh, with this project on, on anti-racism in different regions, uh, in Portugal, in Spain, in Peru and in Brazil. And Monica Cunha, she's, uh, um, she's uh, an activist and she's an activist specifically uh, struggling against police violence and against the imprisonment of, 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 uh, of, young, uh, of young black, uh, black uh, men and uh, uh, youth, sorry. And she's the organization of Moldeke movement and also Frente Pelores Cancelamento, kind of, I translated like a prison abolition front. And uh, I think this is an example of this, of this strength. And also, for instance, she was telling us how, how she presents herself, you know? And, and, and also, she was telling us the, I mean, joy and, and, uh, and despair, they are continuously, you know, in, interlinking. But uh, she's someone that is not, what I say is like, it's not, it's, also kind of escaping of this also a spectacularization you know of uh, of pain like to say but at the same time not to present herself as a kind of consumable object you know so it's all the time like tension in you know tension in this uh, yeah these uh, uh, forces you know that are playing in in um, yeah in the act of resistance and, and revolt thank you that's all
Thank you.